ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Anuj Shah and I'm a partner in Khaitan's corporate and M&A practice group. I'm based in Khaitan's Singapore office. On behalf of the firm, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you, whether you are in our audience in India or overseas. This is the third webinar in our M&A Master's Series in 2023. We are very grateful for the excellent response that we enjoy uh, to these, this series. And, uh, the next slide will be the agenda for the webinar. Uh, Mitesh, if you can do the next slide, please. Uh, on the slide in front of you is the agenda for today's webinar. In short, the format will be a discussion between our expert panel followed by a Q&A session with audience questions. We've already received a few audience questions and if you have additional time for any, and if you have additional questions, please submit them uh, in the webinar portal. Uh, if we cannot cover all the questions, we will definitely respond by email after the session. Please note that after the webinar, you will receive a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording of this session. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Mitesh. Okay, so the, uh, I'll quickly introduce the webinar. Today we have gathered here to discuss key issues in foreign acquisitions by Indian companies uh, to set some context. Although outbound investments from India are significantly smaller compared to the large amounts we receive as inbound investment into India, the number of outbound deals by India Inc. has been steadily increasing. As we will discuss later in this webinar, Indian regulators have significantly liberalized regulations to allow Indian companies to spread their wings and to go global. Indian companies have done numerous overseas acquisitions in the last few years. Uh, including some very large deals across sectors. Uh, and uh, to refresh, uh, you know, we saw Tata Motors buying Jaguar Land Rover in 2008. Uh, recently, we've seen Reliance buying Hamleys. Uh, we saw Wipro buying Capco for a billion and a half dollars in 2021. We saw last year Biocon Biologics buying Vitris, a US-based healthcare company for $3 billion. So there's been some very, very large deals by overseas by Indian Inc. As India comes of age, it is reasonable to expect that Indian companies will continue to look for new markets, new technologies, and access to natural resources. And that, will con and that we will continue to see growth in outbound investments. Therefore, to provide a comprehensive view of Indian M&A landscape, we decided to include this very important topic on foreign acquisitions by Indian companies as part of our M&A Master Series 2023. On the expert panel today, uh, every person who has registered for this webinar would have already received an email with full particulars of the credentials of our panel. So I'll not spend much time on that introduction. However, I would definitely like to say that all our panelists are highly regarded professionals and m and experts with a wealth of experience of doing deals. Uh, we are very grateful to have with us today, Mr. Deepak Acharya who's the Group General Counsel and Chief Legal Officer of the Aditya Birla Group. We'll be shortly joined by Anurag Agarwal. He sends his apologies. He's in transit and his flight got delayed, but we should have him in the next five minutes. He's the Group Head of M&A at TVS Motor Company. We have Leo Bogdat, uh, who's a partner at Davis Polk and Wardwell in London. We are also joined by my senior colleague, Rabindra Junjunwala, who's a partner in Khetan & Company's Corporate and M&A Practice Group. Uh, with this, let's bring in our experts uh, and get the webinar started. So Rabindra, may I ask the first question to you? We know that the overseas investment regime in India has been recently and significantly liberalized. May I ask you to summarize some of the key changes? Thank you, uh, Anuj, firstly, for putting this webinar together and for moderating this panel. Um, thank you to our guest speakers who have taken out time from the busy schedule to share their insights on this uh, master series. To your uh, question, Anuj, there are a host of changes, but let us focus on uh, four key developments. First, there is now a specific definition for overseas 
portfolio investments. And I'll use the acronym OPI uh, during the course of the, web, the webinar. So while the old regime permitted portfolio investments, there was no definition of what constituted portfolio investments. OPI in the new regime now covers minority investments in listed debt, regulated funds, and listed equities abroad. This uh, creates an opportunity and does away with reporting requirements and other conditions otherwise applicable to overseas direct investments. In terms of eligibility, listed companies, individuals, founders, and unlisted companies in very limited circumstances are allowed to undertake OPI. Second, uh, round tripping. Under the old rules, prior approval of the Reserve Bank of India was required for undertaking transactions with an Indian connection. This created uncertainty on the timelines of the transaction and feasibility of actually doing the deal. Due to this, Indian investors were often excluded from certain structures with an existing Indian connection to avoid complicated approval processes and also examinations in subsequent investment rounds. As a consequence, Indian investors investing overseas would lose out on benefits of liquidity events and valuation events. With the recent liberalization, FDI, ODI structures are now permitted, subject to the condition that the investment doesn't lead to more than two layers of subsidiaries. And just to clarify, these two layers are calculated as overseas layers. And therefore, if an Indian company was to invest, say, in a Singapore subsidiary, which would then in turn invest in a Netherlands company, which then would invest back into India, the two layers here would be the overseas uh, companies in Singapore and Netherlands. I said uh, four points, so let's discuss the third one. Uh, and I would, I, would, I would talk about payment of deferred consideration. The current rules also provide flexibility with the contracting parties to decide the amount of consideration which is to be paid upfront and the amount which forms part of deferred consideration. Earlier, you could do this, but there was an approval process. So only if you had a prior approval could you have a deferred consideration mechanism. Lastly, considering that the value of investments made abroad are subject to multiple external factors, uh, Reserve Bank of India has also liberalized, subject to appropriate checks and balances, restructuring and reduction in value of investments undertaken overseas. So I would, uh, Anuj, sum up uh, uh, these are the four critical aspects of uh, the new regime. I'll hand it back to you. you are on mute sorry about that i i said thanks rabindra for that succinct summary i mean we've had a sea change as we see in regulations from the time where indian companies would need basically approval to even make small remittances outside uh, to this uh, uh, field today uh, where indian companies can actually go out and do very large acquisitions now with that maybe i'll ask the second question to leo uh, Leo, few lawyers have had the privilege of having done complex deals across India, US, and Europe, and you are one of them. Uh, we are keen to know from you if there are any differences across jurisdictions, that is US, Europe, India, in outbound deals involving, say, public companies, private companies, and distressed companies. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Anuj, uh, for the question. So. I think it's worth starting with uh, the general observation that I and probably everyone on this panel, all deal makers, has over the past 15 years experienced significant convergence in terms of the process and substance of transactional deal making. Um, the differences are no longer differences in principle, but much more differences uh, in degree. And the reasons for this, from the client's perspective, 
um, are very welcome. Uh, this is a very welcome development, and the reasons include a the number of deals has increased, and there has been a recurring cast of repeat players, bankers, lawyers, clients um, working on these deals, and that has fostered a degree of mutual understanding. People have learned from each other. Um, and it has that gave rise to the deal documents getting more and more similar. I wouldn't call it standardized yet, but they have at least uh, lots of the components have gotten pretty harmonized. Um, and you can think of this as a tangible result of uh, and a driver of globalization. And it's kind of self-reinforcing, right? If things go more, um, um, more get more similar, um, people can point to market practice more easily, and then there's, it, everything gravitates um, to that. Um, that said, there remain notable differences in the way you approach outbound deals, uh, whether there's public or, or private deals. Um, on public and distressed deals, obviously, that's mostly driven by um, uh, by the very different regulatory regime. So in the UK, you have this UK city takeover code, US tender offer rules would apply in America, EU takeover directive would be relevant in EU countries. And I won't go into the details here, uh, also not in the details of bankruptcy, but that's really important. I and mean, those are different playbooks uh, and they are highly regulated. But um, most of the deals that we're seeing are, are, of course, private company um, deals and um, and and Broadly speaking, there, um, what we are seeing is that cross-border private M&A transactions, either they, they tend to use either US-style transaction documents that are typically governed by Delaware or New York law, or UK or European-style transaction documents that are frequently governed by English law, but not always. Like we have seen deals done, uh, French law, Swedish law, um, German law, everything, yeah? And I think the key takeaway here is that there's a widely held perception that a UK or European style agreement and a related market practice is seller friendly. And that by contrast, a, a, a um, US style agreements and related market practice are regarded by some as more buyer friendly. And one fundamental reason for this difference is that um, UK and European market practice tends to regard economic risk as transferring from the seller to the buyer at the time of the signing of the acquisition agreement. Whereas in the US, it's different. Market practice tends to regard economic risk transfer to happen at the point of closing. Um, and that has a couple of tangible consequences if you are going to acquire a business outside, um, outside India. Um, if you are going to acquire it in the US and it follows uh, the acquisition contract uh, and practice follows US law, you would typically work with closing accounts, with sophisticated cash debt and working capital adjustments. Whereas in the UK, you'd have uh, typically a lockbox structure based on historical accounts. It also means that in the UK, warranties are oftentimes not repeated at closing and the accuracy of warranties is rarely a CP to closing. Um, in the US, you would have the reverse position. Um, uh, and the third point is that um, warranties in the US M&A agreement are mostly given on an indemnity basis, whereas um, in a UK agreement, it, it, courts really think about this as, as, as a reduction in value. And if there's no reduction in value, there, um, the warrant, you won't have a claim under, under the warranty. So I could go on. I mean, there are at least 20 different salient points uh, about these differences, but it, what the, 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 the key point here is that it means that defining whether U, US law, UK or European law will be applicable to an acquisition agreement is an important structural decision to be made early on um, by GCs uh, with their counsel. And um, we have seen fights over the governing law of the non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement early on on a deal because clients thought that would be de determinative of the governing law of the ultimate deal documents and oftentimes that's the case. We've also seen US sellers restructure their holdings in a way that allowed them to sell a UK or European or other non-US holding company instead of a UK company, all with a view to get more favorable UK tax treatment, uh, UK law treatment. Um, so, I mean, this is a really important um, uh, decision to make. Um, one of the most interesting phenomena in private M&A um, that we have seen over the past couple of years is, uh, in particular, where the target 
of the acquisition is neither based in the US nor in the UK is a mix and match principle. So the assets would be anywhere in the world. The contract may well be governed by New York law or English law, but because it's a negotiation, you end up with a contract that combines elements of both legal cultures. And that can actually get, be really helpful for Indian clients to get things done because it oftentimes helps overcome cultural or other barriers. Um, but it also requires for the Indian client, it requires lawyers with ambidextrous thinking, people that are not purists and they don't show false provincial pride regarding their home jurisdiction law. Um, so that can, they can be very flexible in their approach and very helpful to their Indian clients. Um, those would be my 50 cents. Over, over to you, Anush. I think those are some great insights uh, on how uh, cultural issues have a direct impact on deal making and someone who has this uh, uh, diverse perspective, and not a, as you said, not a purist, but these are some great views. Thanks for that, Leo. Uh, Mr. Acharya, over a career spanning more than 30 years, you have led as the lead counsel, in-house counsel, some of the largest outbound uh, deals uh, done by Indian companies. What's your view? on how should one structure a team to undertake a foreign acquisition? And who are the key advisors you need and how do you select them? So I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you, Anuj. Uh, and and uh, great to be on this panel. Um, you know, um, one of the key things in m &A transactions, I feel is that these are incredibly important commercial dealings for the companies and um, the the kind of team that one chooses will determine uh, how this is um, implemented and how this uh, contracts and, and documentation works for the company. So as a GC, I think one of the most uh, important tasks that is uh, in front of the general counsel is how do you constitute a team that will work uh, in harmony with one another and deliver the results for the company. Um, oftentimes, I compare, uh, you know, M&A team uh, like an orchestra, which uh, you know have a different players and have uh, different players in the orchestra have different uh, instruments playing. But at the end of the day, you know, the kind of uh, results that you see of the orchestra is a is a fantastic music. It all depends on how each one of them are playing their part. Uh, in that orchestra. Likewise, um, you know, if, if it's a team of lawyers that a you know, large m &A does involve a team of uh, different lawyers, uh, a lawyer uh, or a team of lawyers which understand the lay of the land, uh, those who really understand the regulations and local uh, environment is very, very critical. Um, you know, uh, I'll give you some examples as uh, if you're you know, doing a deal in Europe, perhaps, uh, and that deal involves uh, acquiring asset, which has a lot of, uh, you know, PII information. Obviously, you would want to uh, consult the right uh, privacy lawyer in Europe, which is uh, very, very critical legislation. Uh, or GDPR is one of them. So uh, uh, in, in Germany, for example, if you're buying a business, you have to have a clear understanding that in Germany, uh, getting an injunction generally is is a you know you can get an injunction in few days, uh, not in months or in a year. So one has to keep this nuance in mind as we look for the law firm and look for the local lawyers. Um, uh, also, uh, you know some of the areas where you may need little more uh, expertise apart from the MNA lawyers, and for example, would require. Uh, competition law approvals are needed in some geographies when you are doing an MA transaction. Um, you know, whether you have the right team of people that would foresee what are the implications of the MA deal and where will you need that kind of a help is uh, also very, very critical uh, from, from deciding the whole team uh, that you want to put together. At the end of the day, I think the the way you construct your team, including your investment banker, including your outside law firm, and including your internal, uh, you know, in-house team, 
they have to work uh, in a way that the sum of the team itself is more than the number of individuals that are there. So there is a kind of synergy that we draw from one another. Uh, instead of trying to kind of overlook what uh, other person is doing, if people are able to focus on what they are doing, and if they are doing that in the right way, I think it's a uh, it, that is the team that would work wonderfully well in any large M&A transaction. Well, those are some uh, great comments, Mr. Acharya. Thank you for that. It's uh, it's a lot of learning for uh, some of us uh, who practice every day on those deals. Uh, so very very good inputs. Anurag, you are just on time. You know, first I should thank you uh, that we know you had. Uh, a flight that uh, got delayed and you had to rush into this but thanks for your commitment you're just in time when we have the question ready for you i was discussing with mr acharya uh, that you know when you and you've done a number of uh, outbound deals and we wanted to understand from you from a business side uh, if you have any inputs on how one should structure a team to undertake foreign m a acquisitions and on advisors if you have a view how do you select uh advisors when you do uh, some of these overseas acquisitions sure uh first i apologize for the delay i'm sorry i was uh as i said this morning it was a little the flight was delayed and there was some transportation hiccups let's put it mildly uh but i'm glad i'm here and thank you for inviting me and having on the panel and thank you uh it's, it's great to be on this panel and uh, i know you were mentioning anuj you're bringing some heavy hitters but clearly i can see the the heavy hitters are all in front of me right now. So very, very nice. Thank you. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, looking at uh, cross-border, looking at uh, deals and teams to be built up, obviously the usual suspects of, you know, the legal, financial, commercial, tax, uh, background, integrity, I think uh, we find that very helpful um, because quite often in the deals that you're doing, um, you, don't, you may not know much about the background of the people, um, you know, that you're kind of working with. Um, it's different when you're in India and you know each other and you know you have familiarity, uh, which goes beyond the textbook, you know, beyond the documents. Um, that kind of intelligence is extremely important. Uh, and it depends on the nature of the deal, especially if you have earnouts associated or you have a deal which is part, uh, you know, where you're kind of uh, doing a little bit of a structured transaction. Then the uh, familiarity with the other side and their kind of background becomes a big issue for us, becomes a big issue in terms of dealing with it. Um, the other thing um, that we've, uh, that's helped us or helped me at least personally in, in a lot of the deals is, um, it's not just about the advisors uh, understanding the local laws, uh, but I think it's a lot of importance also to understand us as a company. Um, because that makes the bulk of the difference, right? In terms of, and I've worked with both kinds of advisors, people who understand us versus people who are good in the law and who are aggressive, but who have very little resonance with how we operate as a company. And uh, because ultimately when a deal is being done, as um, Steve uh, very rightfully pointed out, it's kind of an orchestra, right? Everything is moving together. It's like a flow happening. And in that flow, uh, it's not just about the law. It's not just about, it's about people dynamics. It's about moving people along, taking them along. And uh, quite frankly, you know, as we work with even uh, Ketan and company, and we're working with your help, your advisors then in terms of your relationships that you have across the globe, that makes a big difference to us because you all then become the interconnect, right? Uh, but that's a very, very important part of who we work with in terms of across, across the board. Um, so for me, that piece is important. And then um, um, it's also important to uh, understand someone who understands you I mean, as a business, as people, and then your needs. Uh, that becomes very critical. You know, what is it that you're really trying to achieve um, and not the ideal situation, right? Because your needs may be different. Um, and that's why it, come, it connects with someone who understands you, not just in the short term, but in the longer term. Um, so for me, that makes a big difference while choosing advisors uh, and planning things out. Great inputs again, and all that I can say on behalf of Ketan Company. For us, it's an honor and pleasure uh, every time you trust us uh, with your matters. Uh, Anurag, maybe one step, just taking a step back sure. uh, from, you know, we got into legal, but one question 
I think uh, as we are planning for this session also, we received some of these questions from our audience, uh, but I thought you are best place to answer this. But look, we've had a lot of relaxations for Indian companies to go overseas, flex yeah. their muscles, fl spread their wings, do overseas acquisitions. But you know, if you look at the percentage, the inbound, we received, let's say, a very large amount of inbound, but and compared to that inbound, the outbound is a small percentage. Uh, do you expect this gap to continue? I uh, look. The fact is, at the global macro level, if you step back, India is the happening place, right? India is the country where, from a manufacturing, from a market perspective, uh, the next ten years, you know, if you, I mean, I, I wish I could see beyond. But at least from whatever we can imagine and we can see, clearly there's a lot of interest in India, right? And therefore the inbounds are bound to happen. I think from an outbound perspective, um, you know, there is going to be a lot more opportunity as well, right? Uh, I think as we scale up in manufacturing, uh, we'll recognize our strengths in terms of the cost effectiveness that we bring to global markets. And so we will see a lot more of that. But I don't see the ratio changing drastically anytime soon, in my view. Um, you know, uh, I mean, maybe it's 10 is to 1 will become 5 is to 1 or you know, that kind of a ratio. But clearly, the inbound interest will be uh, much stronger uh, in the near term. But I don't see the fact that outbound is not happening. You know, we've done a lot of fair bit of outbound activity ourselves. Um, and uh, there will be different kind nature of the outbound might also change right more in terms of collaborations more in terms of partnerships more in terms of technology more in terms of um, accessing some specific markets that you want to address um, so i think that nature will change uh, but i you know ultimately the world is um, there is a geopolitical shift happening in the world right um, it's it's uh, bound to kind of reshape how we look at the world India will play a larger voice. Um, and I think as companies in India also become bolder, right, uh, in taking these steps outside of India, um, there will be a lot more outbound activity. Well, I, thought, I think, you know, uh, this is uh, very insightful and uh, it's great to hear this from you who are in the midst of, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the corporate action. So thanks for that. Uh, now, no, if I, may add, yeah, if I quickly add a couple of points here, um, you know, one that, um, of course, uh, it also depends from industry to industry. Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the IT sector from where I come, actually, uh, prior to this, film, uh, most of the MA deals uh, in IT sector have been done outside of India. They were all outbound investments that were done. Uh, primarily because India businesses were uh, in IT sector were smaller and the opportunities outside uh, are, are much larger uh, opportunities that are existing today. So I, I would say uh, some sectors, you will see more activities that are happening um, outside of India and outbound investments are taking place. Even uh, in the other sectors, I would, you know, just reflect on uh, our group, which actually started investing outside of India way before actually anybody started thinking about it. Only a handful of people who actually started investing outside of India. And we were one of the first groups to be investing outside of India. And I see that, uh, and I agree with Anurag, that we may not see a very huge difference because the opportunities exist mostly in India. But uh, in, in some sectors, in some businesses, uh, indeed, there is an opportunity to uh, invest outside of India as well. I, I have a slightly different view, Anuj, and uh, uh, to what Anurag and Deepak are saying. I do believe that there's going to be a substantial increase in the number of outbound investments. And with the liberalized regime uh, and the fact that there are companies who are not as actively seen as uh, acquirers, uh, we will see uh, second tier, third tier cities uh, suddenly springing uh, corporates who, who will do one time acquisition, but they will very much be in the fray. But we we, we, we can compare notes in uh, a year's time. Super. And to add to that, the number of inquiries we get 
from companies outside India today. Um, it's incredible, right? In terms of just to see the number of kind of, especially given the fact that those markets are kind of struggling and companies are struggling. Um, a lot of activity, a lot of um, inquiries come uh, for capital raising, for us to acquire them. I mean, it's it's just, it's, it's incredible the amount of uh, um, inbound calls that we get in that regard. Great. I mean, the world continues to be divided. It's great that at least businesses are uniting the world. Uh, in India, as we say, Vasudev Kutumbagam. So the entire world looks like a family and we hope uh, this trend continues, uh, more integration, more business uh, overseas. Uh, Mr. Acharya, you wanted to say something or I uh, proceed with my next question? Oh yeah, okay, I can proceed. Um, I think, uh, Leo, maybe I can come to you for my next question. Uh, now we thought, you know, for, because we, we wanted to get an international perspective and we thought based on your extensive experience in advising several Indian clients on foreign M&A deals. Uh, we thought, can you ask? Can we ask you uh, if you were to recommend or suggest to us some best practices that Indian lawyers can benefit from? Because you have seen uh, the whole gamut. What would those uh, recommendations be? Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> difficult for me to make recommendations because the Indian lawyers and the Indian uh, general counsels and le in-house legal teams generally are some of the most sophisticated that I have ever worked with. So. Um, take, take everything I say, with, not with a grain, but with a shovel of salt. But um, um, one thing is, one observation I would make is about the strength of the promoter, right? Having a promoter can be a significant opportunity in the context of a contemplated foreign acquisition. It allows you to be quick, coherent and decisive. It allows you to positively differentiate the potential acquirer, so you as a client from potential competitors for the asset. The competitors may be more bureaucratic, they may be more internally fragmented, and actually they may be less personal or less personable. And I've seen promoters make that first and final call, right, over the course of a transaction to the other side CEO or to the other side's co-founder, and that's really where the deal gets locked in and all the competition was was fended off, right? So I think it's important for GCs and in-house um, M&A teams to play to that strength by demonstrating and reinforcing these positive qualities of having a, a, a promoter from minute one of the transactions. And the GC and the senior business people can be um, key enablers for the promoter in that context. So they need to do their homework together with their lawyers and bankers so that they can then assist the promoter to act decisively and make these very important calls. And I mean this met calls metaphorically, but I actually also mean this literally, like picking up the phone and, and have these, these few very critical interactions as the transaction goes along. that can be very, very helpful in particular as compared to sometimes very bureaucratic, um, publicly listed strategic uh, acquirers that are competitors for an asset from, from other parts of the world. Um, the second best practice um, is obviously staffing, but lots has been said about that. I mean, but finding the right international counsel advising on your foreign acquisition is really key. And you want someone who has a proven track record of working seamlessly cooperatively and successfully with, with the Indian Council of your choice and hopefully many different Indian Council. Um, so because that, that really should seal what Anurag said. He, he was talking about someone who listens to you, someone who understands your needs, your desires, your interests. That's really important. You want someone with a heart um, who doesn't just display the qualities of a mercenary, but a, uh, qualities of a companion who will be there for you in the medium to long term and who will go with you through thick and thin. Um, and I think the final observation I would share is that once you've chosen your preferred law firm and a partner within that law firm, I think it's, got, uh, it's good not to be afraid of the sometimes extreme focus on the drafting of the transaction agreements and the seriousness with which 
your international counsel and opposing counsel will go about the drafting. I've had a client once ask, do we really need to pay that much attention to the written word? And they also asked, is this even enforceable? And I mean, they were talking a little bit about uh, historical Indian um, uh, experiences with enforceability. And the answer to that is that typically it is. The, your the contracts would be drafted with, with enforceability in, uh, in mind. And um, it's more than just cultural. There's just a tremendous focus, in particular in the United States and in the UK, on getting the client in the best possible position drafting-wise. Not necessarily to optimize for a potential dispute, but rather the opposite, to avoid a dispute altogether. I think great inputs again. Uh, Anurag, maybe I can come back to you once more. It's, uh, you know, uh, we, it's good to keep getting some business inputs. Now, from a business uh, side of things, would you have some recommendations on key steps and considerations uh, one should be mindful of when structuring a foreign acquisition or investment? Um, again, I, you know, in terms of when you're structuring again, we look at, you know, you're looking at all the different sides, legal, tax, financial, commercial, all of them are again playing this, you know, looking at all different dimensions in parallel. Um, and to Leo's point, again, you know, you get stuck many times with the documentation, right? And you get many times stuck with the structuring and you think structuring is uh, is what's required. Um, but my, uh, one of the lessons I have learned is that not to, to also think through the longer term aspect, especially given in India, there's a regulatory kind of uh, the laws uh, um, require you to think through all the dimensions of long-term funding, for example. Um, especially when you come into situations where you've acquired a company abroad. Um, and if that company then lands up doing some work in India through that subsidiary or through that activity, for example, a round tripping issue comes up, right? Now, if you've really not thought through the structuring in the long term of the funding requirements of that subsidiary or what that activity will be in the longer term, right, and you structure it for the short term, you could kind of come up with that, with a problem um, in the future. So it ties into what I was saying earlier when we're looking at advisors, that you really need to think of something holistically as a important, like, you know, many times you say, hey, you know, I had the subsidiary abroad, let me just buy it from there. But it may not be that easy. It may not be as simple as that. In the short term, it may work out for you. And you may say, okay, I want to get the deal done immediately, so let me do it. But then longer term impact of it could be a much more, uh, it could cause you a lot more trouble. So for me, the biggest thing is think about all the different dimensions of it, not just for the short term. Think about how you're integrating it into the company. Think about the longer term dimension of, um, of how are you going to fund it where the cash proceeds are going to go, how are the company is going to then use those cash proceeds, how is it going to come back to India, if at all, how are you going to create value, play that scenario out. Um, and I think out there, even as legal counsel, um, you know, for me, uh, I think legal counsels can play a very vital role in that, right? Um, because what I really enjoy is if you have a legal counsel who actually understands the business side of it, right? And you can advise on that dimension of it, because then you know you're covered. Um, uh, and so I think it's a very, uh, for me, th that's been a very, very important piece of it as we look at structuring. I think thanks for those frank inputs and some great inputs there, Anurag. Uh, my next question is to both Leo and Mr. Acharya. Uh, perhaps I can request Mr. Acharya to go first. Uh, uh, Mr. Acharya, what are some of the most important contractual issues that need to be addressed in a foreign m and deal? Uh, and what approach do you typically take to issues like governing law and dispute resolution in foreign MA contracts? Oh, thanks so much for this. Uh, I think Leo has touched upon this topic uh, in his uh, opening remarks as well. Um, you know, the way I look at the MA transaction was to understand what is the requirement of the business? Uh, what is it that the business? is trying to achieve and where is it that we will create a synergy or a value for the deal that we are looking to acquire and if i am able to work with my team in a way where i am able to uh, block any um, you know um, any issues that would 
reduce the value of the deal, then that is my first and foremost object. How do I look at the value leakers and block those values, uh, value leakers from the uh, agreement so that uh, what business is trying to achieve is able to achieve ultimately? Because uh, I, I don't want to have the best agreement in place at one stage, but not have the deal uh, uh, achieving its objective. Uh, so deal as a business objective that it needs to achieve. Uh, and therefore we as a legal team need to work with the business to make sure that those business objectives are achieved. Any terms and conditions that uh, support that business objective is what I would go after. I mean, uh, uh, there are some specific uh, aspects which are more important in some geographies. Uh, one needs to look at those uh, aspects more carefully. Uh, and see how we can protect ourselves. Uh, I can give you an example in, in, in US, for example, if you're acquiring an interest where there are minority shareholders or minority issues, um, US being a very litigious uh, market where you know you can have a class action a lawsuit, etc. You have to be very, very clear in terms of how you want to structure a deal, which is very transparent and very, uh, you know, is, is not open to litigation, particularly from a class action point of view. So uh, certainly uh, specific geography plays a lot of uh, important role. I can give you another example of uh, say Japan and Korea. In Japan and Korea, if there's any issue that you have uh, with the government, uh, you don't want that issue to be litigated with the government because um, you know uh, the culture and uh, oriental culture culture in specific, uh, Japan, Korea would not really encourage a lawsuit against the governments and the courts there really don't support you much when you're fighting a lawsuit against the government. So there are certain nuances that you need to keep in mind as you structure your deal, as you work through your uh, commercial transaction and keep in mind those specific nuances of the geography as you work on that deal. I think some great inputs, sir. Thank you for those. Uh, uh, Leo, you want to add? I know you touched on governing law, yeah, but if you have. Uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Acharya already set out some, some very important principles here. I mean, the only thing that I would perhaps add is that uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that in public company acquisitions, um, we're basically cashing out shareholders. The way this gets structured, if, in particular in the US, is I mean, you have no post closing remedy against the former owners. So you better be very clear about uh, your due diligence, what you, the marching orders for your team, the relevant materiality thresholds, and hold you, hold them and the lawyers um, to that. I mean, sometimes a red flag, high-level due diligence report is just not enough. Sometimes it pays to have the right specialist consultants on top of your lawyers involved in a deal and i see several of you in particular the, the business people on this call are, are nodding here i mean it pays right it's it's a penny wise pound foolish if you say like you're, you're acquiring a manufacturing company in the u.s midwest i mean this is, you can wake me up at three in the morning and i will say well let's do an environmental let's get environmental specialists in there and see whether whether this, these plants actually sit on some site where 40 years ago um, something was manufactured that, that constitutes a significant environmental liability. Yeah, we see that all the time. There are, I remember a couple of years ago, um, we, were, we were advising on a transaction in, in the cement industry and there were uh, dozens of dormant companies on the work chart. Nobody knew what they were about. And it turned out that the, um, that they were actually former operating subsidiaries that um, dealt with um, that, that dealt with asbestos products, right? And they were still there from the 1950s, 1960s, so as not to collapse a corporate structure and 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 allow um, liability potentially to flow up upstairs. Um, and if you have a if you just look at the work chart and the buyer, the seller tells you, well, these are all dormant companies. Well, yes, they are dormant, but that doesn't mean that they 
they don't have uncrystallized or even crystallized liabilities attached to them. So I think for public company acquisitions, this is it's very important to, to always keep in mind. There is no recourse against the former owners other than in very, very uh, rare circumstances. Hey, baby, I'll, 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 yes, sir. Point what, what just Leo uh, also said is more and more companies are now also trying to look at, uh, you know, ensuring some of the risks that come out of the M&A deal. Uh, uh, of course, it's a, it's a double-edged sword and, and more you do a due diligence and more you know about those risks, uh, a known risk can, uh, can rarely be uh, insured, but at the same time, uh, insurance is coming out as a good way for companies to protect their risks from some of the unknown risks that the m and transaction may, may entail. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a, a very good point. Yeah. And if I may add um, to Leo's point, you know, when we talk about doing a deal outside, right, and what kind of issues come up or don't come up, uh, many times, especially if you're not familiar with the outbound kind of acquisition, or it's the first time you're going out or you're going to a country where you're not kind of used to doing deals, you may not be even aware of some of the issues that come up, yeah. or could come up, right? Or are relevant to that geography. Right. To the extent that, for example, like when we're talking about manufacturing and you're talking about US, from an Indian context, environmental doesn't play that big a role, right? Whereas in the US, it's such a big deal. And one could clearly be blindsided if you just say, let's do a red flags only, let's kind of do that kind of diligence where you yeah. might just get caught, you, you may not be aware of it. So I think as you're working with, you know, in terms of advice, if we had to give that, as you're looking at kind of working with companies, um, you know, especially companies who are not familiar or are doing a deal in that geography for the first time, it, the advisors you choose become even more important. Right? Yeah. It can actually handhold you a little bit. Um, so from that angle, it becomes extremely important. I'm seeing there's a lot of pressure on advisors. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Acharya, just uh, we, are, we are actually running short of time, but I know this subject is passionate to you, that when you, you know, a lot of deals are not typical brick and mortar deals. Uh, when we do global acquisition and when we do deals outside India, sometimes data protection, GDPR matters, CFIUS issues, when you have these federal contracts, intellectual property matters become very important. You want to just quickly touch upon uh, when you come across, you know, a part of these questions we've already covered, but maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, a few more comments from you when you come across these sensitive new age issues, how do you deal uh, with such matters? So you're on mute, I think. My apologies, I'm on mute. But most of these new age companies and, and, and the acquisitions that happen with the IT sector particularly, uh, value gets created because of the intellectual property. The intellectual property would constitute maybe 80 or 90% of the value. 10% uh, value would be the, the real assets that this company is having, which you're acquiring. So um, the way to look at you know, protecting the intellectual property that you are acquiring and the way to protect the customer data that you are acquiring or the customer contracts that you're acquiring becomes very, very critical. And in that, uh, you know, uh, compliance with GDPR, uh, compliance with, uh, you know, um, uh, federal uh, contractor system in the US, these, they, these play really an important role because if, if there is a non-compliance on, say, for example, privacy-related matters on a GDPR, uh, and it continues when you acquire that business, you run a risk which is a very, very high. Uh, today, uh, GDPR has a risk which is, or, or a penalty which is of 20 million uh, euros and above. Uh, we see that happening in other markets as well. So obviously, uh, when you're acquiring company that has, uh, you know, uh, non brick and mortar company due diligence and understanding uh, what exactly is the data that you are acquiring how is that data stored is that data uh, in a in a you know secured environment or not becomes very very critical similarly you know whether a deal would require approval from the us government and now actually most countries uh, have this system where you need an approval 
from the agency, uh, whether it is FIBR in, in Australia. Uh, India itself has a requirement for approval if you're investing from some, some specific countries. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, sometimes we feel that approval itself is sufficient for m and deal or for deal to be, you know, business to be acquired. But oftentimes we will realize that the conditions that the agencies will put while approving those deals become really, really onerous. Uh, for example, if you have a federal contractor system and you're acquiring a business which is a federal contractor system and then uh, the conditions that US government would apply to you would be that you will keep your network very separate. You will have a, a cyber security personnel who will be a US national and the kind of synergy that you would want it to uh, get from the business, you're not able to get that synergy. So very critical aspect of acquiring, uh, you know, uh, companies that are non brick and mortar company. So understand uh, what are you getting into in terms of uh, approvals at the same time, uh, how do you make sure that the business that you're acquiring is absolutely compliant to the extent you can, you know, do a due diligence and, and, and figure that out. Okay, great input. Maybe, if, uh, you know, uh, because we have a little bit of paucity of time. And my last question of this uh, uh, part is to Rabindra. And uh, Ravindra, the question is that we see several, at least in new age companies, we see several of these externalized structures where we see uh, new age tech companies having their holding companies outside of India. Uh, would you throw some light on this trend? So yes, uh, uh, this is this is something which uh, we've seen a fair bit where there are uh, they are headquartered overseas. Um, and I would say that, see, we are a market which is still opening up, it's still growing, it's adopting and things won't happen overnight with a flick of a switch. So sometimes there are certain businesses which are more suitable to be set up in another jurisdiction. And for various uh, reasons, uh, let's let's look at some of these. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the regulatory regime in India limits the scope of the business, uh, depending on the political and economic sentiments uh, in relation to uh, such a business. Uh, and to give examples, let's see businesses uh, which, which are in cryptos, cryptocurrencies, or whether they're in the news, uh, drones uh, or online gaming, uh, you know, they are susceptible to either a, a stricter regulatory regime or, or worse, uh, uncertain in, term, in terms of the regulation itself. Hence, uh, companies engaged in these sectors often house uh, uh, it in other jurisdictions which uh, provide a safer harbor. Uh, let's take uh, uh, ease of raising funds as another example. Uh, in India, all foreign investments are subject to and governed uh, by the Foreign Exchange Management Act. And in order to raise funds from abroad, an Indian company will have to adhere to uh, various uh, you know, sector-based uh, conditionalities and uh, sometimes investment-based restrictions under our uh, system. Uh, you know, there'll be compliances, sometimes permission-based requirements, uh, and sometimes they do get challenging. So uh, there are again uh, avenues which are available in in the global market for these entities uh, to, to to source uh, uh, funds in at better terms uh, you have uh, uh, sometimes uh, the global supply and demand dynamic in a specific industry uh, which uh, you know often provide a larger customer base uh, in a foreign jurisdiction or, or, or companies are able to derive higher value while placing their product uh, or service in uh, such a foreign market. Um, another advantage is uh, of the externalized structure is greater access to public market uh, listing and access to uh, retail investors who invest on uh, global stock exchanges. So, you know, some industry experts uh, also maintain that uh, stocks in specific sectors or segments may fetch uh, much better valuation in, in overseas uh, jurisdiction. So there are several uh, uh, other reasons, uh, you know, including pricing guidelines, uh, tax benefits, uh, valuation advantages, uh, exchange rate risks. Uh, you know, so one can go on and on, but I know we are short on time and we like to finish uh, on time. But uh, the one thing which I would leave behind uh, when you ask about, about the question is, uh, you know, interestingly and more recently, we are seeing a reverse flipping uh, 
uh, which is happening and that is that is uh, on the rise due to uh, you know the new liberalized regime where some indian fintech uh, startups who are domiciled abroad are considering or have shifted their base to india and uh, i mean to give examples all all from public domain which which is which is known to everyone uh, look at razor pay uh, it was domiciled in the us to raise funds uh, it's in the process of moving back its parent entity to india from the us and again apparently due to tighter sectoral regulations in the us so you know it's a moving uh, 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 the yeah. other, other example which come to mind is uh, phone pay which also shifted its holding company from singapore to india so you know uh, those are some of the uh, uh, comments which i would uh, make anuj and i hope we are on time yeah. yeah great inputs and we are on time and we have a i think the next segment is audience questions and we have a couple of uh, audience questions maybe we can take a few of them uh, there is a question which has come from atvik reddy from delhi and he asks a question that I have a query regarding pricing and valuation. Determining the right valuation and negotiating a fair price for the target company can be complex. Variations in accounting practices, methodologies, and market conditions between India and the foreign country may affect the pricing and the financial projection. Uh, do you have any recommendation uh, on, on, uh, on, on, on this, how to achieve? Uh, what method to use for a good uh, to achieve the right uh, pricing? And I think logically the question can perhaps only travel to Anurag uh, because. Uh, well, hopefully, I wish I knew that answer actually, because uh, it's as much of an art as a science, right? Um, and I think um, just as an observation, what I've seen is a lot of the pricing and valuation in the West, right, or in the more developed markets is around data. So that's where a lot of the models and the comps and the comparables and all of that help you give guidelines. And then as much of it is a, you know, the science piece of it kind of plays out, you kind of then merge towards uh, some sort of value, right? Um, ultimately value is driven by what someone's willing to pay for it and what someone will accept. Right? That's the only way, that's the only benchmark of value. Um, but in the newer age deals that you see, right, in terms of the tech deals and, you know, those valuations, honestly, who knows, right? Okay. In terms of you don't know the basis for those deals and you don't know the basis for, you know, how those values are being set uh, because data can, you can use whatever justification you want uh, and numbers, spreadsheets can be, you know, Spreadsheet has spreadsheets ultimately, and you're basing all your value on future projections. Um, so that's my two cents on it. You know, honestly, oh, if you ask. Me. Great. Yeah, I, I think I think Anurag, uh, uh, to add to that, one shoe cannot fit all circumstances. So it yeah. will have to be very specific to the facts uh, in 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 the particular in a particular case. But just a case in point, uh, when I mentioned about a valuation advantage uh, to the last question that Anuj asked me. Uh, you see certain times companies may be able to receive a higher valuation for its businesses when peg pegged to a similar business in a global market uh, which which perhaps maybe is generally denominated in a higher value currency so uh, you know that's one example to respond to the question uh, if, if i take another example in an externalized structure it is possible to hedge uh, such an investment against uh, the exchange risks involved uh, with the Indian rupee, uh, you know, there's a second. Uh, so there could be uh, 50 different points which each one of us yeah. can bring to the table. Yeah, yeah. So I think great inputs again, and I agree. Uh, I'm no valuation expert, but I read somewhere that valuation and beauty right, lies in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think that is uh, that is how it works. Maybe a fun question. Uh, we've been asked this question before as well. And uh, it is uh, for a young and aspirational lawyer or investment professional. Can you recommend a book that every professional should read? And maybe I think we should give chance to all of us uh, to answer this question. Uh, who wants to go first? I mean, this is my chance. Maybe, maybe because we get instructions from our clients all the time. So you know, maybe we start with Mr. Acharya and then Hanurag. <laughs> and, uh, you're mute. 
can't hear you. I'm sorry again. So I think the uh, the one which I would definitely recommend is uh, written by a friend of mine, uh, which is called book called GPS Paradigm. Uh, the GPS Paradigm is all about the uh, MA uh, activities, and it's a very concise book, not a very uh, very book big boring book. A very interestingly written book. So that is the one I would recommend from my side for sure. Okay. Uh, Anurag, you want to go next? I honestly, I've not, for me, it's been apprenticeship and the learning through that mode. So the more deals you do, the more you learn. Um, and texts tend to be a little bit kind of theoretical, in my opinion. Um, so from my perspective, it's the more you do, just keep doing it. You know, the more you do it, the more you do it, the more you do it, you just pick up more and more. And then everything falls away. Um, so I'm, I'm in that mode, honestly. That's my only recommendation. Great. Uh, Leo, and then we go to Rapindra. That's difficult. Um, I'm actually quite, perhaps I'm the new, new age or very old school. I, I read a lot. Um, the one book that has been recommended to me by one of my mentors and which I've read twice in the meantime is uh, it's called The 100 Year Life, Living and Working in an Age of Longevity. I don't recall the names of the authors, um, but they outline the challenges and intelligent choices that all of us of any age need to make in order to turn greater life expectancy into a gift and not a curse. So they're basically talking about what do you do with age 60 to 100 if you actually have a life from 60 to 100? Interesting. Uh, Rabindra? Well, uh, you know, uh, of course, reading books has its uh, huge advantages, but I, I'm somewhat like Anurag and uh, my response is really that uh, what one learns from experience and from observing what happens um, and look at look at transactions, how much uh, has changed over a period of time when we were doing this physically in a room versus uh, doing it virtually. The learning curve has uh, changed for the young lawyers. So I would say get out there, uh, get get involved uh, on, on, on transactions, see what is happening um, and, 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 you know, learn from from that i mean there's so many deals which have happened over over a, a failed transaction have happened over a drink uh, because you ran into each other at the airport and uh, you said well you know at least we couldn't do a deal let's be friends and uh, a couple of drinks later the deal happens so you know there are so many of these experiences uh, one could write a book on it and uh, anush to add to that i think the learning today is not just about the book for me uh, mm -hmm. It's not about I don't read books, but the fact is a lot of the learning is happening through podcasts or through tweets that I kind of see or like, you know, like Ray Dalio, like I'll read something about him. It's not a book per se. I, I don't think I'll go through the entire book that he's written, but, you know, a 10 minute podcast or a 10 minute video by him. That could be a bigger way of learning in today's world uh, than really reading one book per se. For me, that's that's what's working, you know, honestly. Great. Anuj, not so quickly. Uh, you've asked us the questions. You can't be sitting and moderating and throwing questions to us. Uh, why don't you respond? To this? You should respond to the same. You, you respond to the same question, and maybe uh, others may want to ask you an additional one. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, if you ask me on the book, because uh, I've thought about it, I came across this book called The Billionaire Who Wasn't. Uh, it's on the founder of General Atlantic. Uh, how he creates General Atlantic and then gives everything away to philanthropy. Uh, a very low profile person called Chuck Feeney. Uh, and I was really awestruck uh, by that book. So I really, I picked it up during COVID times and I, I hope uh, I haven't had the chance since then to uh, read a lot, but uh, that book stayed with me. Uh, Lovely, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, as we, so as we uh, come towards the end of this webinar, I thought, I can do a quick summary of some of the takeaways for our audience uh, on some of the things, themes we picked up uh, from the webinar. I mean, we see there are mixed views on whether inbound MA will continue to form a bigger chunk of deals than outbound MA. Uh, definitely in the near term, inbound uh, would be significantly larger than outbound. Uh, but uh, in the long term, uh, you never know. Uh, 
uh, then we saw that structuring a team for an outbound M&A deal is critical. We need to be mindful of appointing the right advisors with local knowledge, market experience, and it is important that adv advisors understand the ethos of their client and their business needs. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deepak made this point that the team should work in harmony, much like in orchestra, where the sum is greater than its individual parts. And then we see a convergence of legal cultures in cross-border acquisitions, uh, including in acquisition agreements to incorporate clauses uh, we generally see in the UK or the US, which would help Indian clients achieve their business needs. So for me, these were uh, some of the takeaways, and there were many more, but uh, we could only pick a few. Uh, the next thing that we do as part of this webinar, we put a poll. Uh, and Mitesh, uh, before closing, if I can request you to, to put this uh, poll slide on the screen, everyone uh, in the audience uh, gets to give a feedback, and we take this feedback very seriously as part of our continuous uh, improvement program. I do not realize, Mitesh, that you don't allow organizers and panelists to vote. Uh, okay, great. And uh, uh, to conclude, I would just I would like to thank each of our guests for sharing their experience and expertise with us today. Deepak, Anurag, and Leo, many thanks for your time. Without you, this webinar would not have been possible. Your insights were very valuable, and we are very much indebted to you. To our audience, I hope you found the webinar interesting and worthwhile investment of your time. We certainly enjoyed bringing it to you. After the webinar, we will send to you a copy of today's presentation materials and a link to the webinar recording. You will also separately receive a request for your feedback on this webinar. Uh, please take the time to send us your feedback, comments, appreciation, criticism. Uh, this will take uh, less than a minute of your time to complete. Uh, please do not hesitate to contact us regarding any matters arising from this webinar. Our contact information is on the contact slide at the end of this webinar. And thank you for your attendance today. And we look forward to being of service again at future webinars. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much, everyone. Thanks, Anuj. Well done. Thank you for hosting Thank you. us. Thanks, everyone. Entirely a pleasure. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. to Anurag and Rabindra for you know scrambling it. You were traveling, but still managed to get into this. Thanks much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.